All right, we're back. This is Senate Health and Welfare. Uh, it is January 18th, 2023. We're now have invited uh, Chris, Chris Doss yes. of the Rand Foundation to come in with us and to answer questions and to carry through our um, dialogue on the early ed care and education financing study. So um, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And we'll go around the room our, and sort of introduce ourselves so you know who you're working with. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm Ruth Hardy. It's yeah. nice to meet you in person. Likewise. Terry Williams, Broughton. Very nice to meet you. Jenny Lyons. Uh, David Weeks, Broughton County. And um, Elaine Bullock has taken a trip over to meet with the treasurer, but she'll be back as well. Martine. Martine. Martine Gulick. What did I say? Elaine. Well, it was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so Martine will be back. <laughs> I don't know where Elaine is. <laughs> OK, this is great. Uh, so after your presentation, there were some questions that I think we each had. And um, so, I don't know where to begin because it's going to take us all over the place. Um, and you touched on a lot of the questions that we might want to look at. But, you know, one of the assumptions that you made was that this is, or that you identified, that this, that any, the changes that we would be making to fill the gap would have um, a, a low effect on the, on, our income and our economy, or on workers' economy. I don't know exactly how you said it. But can you talk about that a little bit? Because if we're if we're at a place where we're trying to raise money to fill a gap, whatever that gap may be, um, how do you determine that it's going to have little effect on one's income or ability to survive economically? Right, no, that's a great question. I'll start and then um, I'll throw it to Aaron, uh, who got into the weeds with the, the modeling of that part. But when, when we say it would have a small effect on, on workers, we kind of look at total economic well-being. So if you think about their income, which unless you're part of the ECE system, wouldn't be affected by this, right? Um, if you think about the uh, average package that a person spends their income on throughout the state, throughout the year, the taxes that would be levied as part of our proposals, for example, would have would be a small portion of their of their average um, expenditures, and so we wouldn't expect that the uh, the additional expenditure on a per family basis would be so onerous as to like perhaps change their their standard standard of living in any appreciable way. Um, Aaron, did you want to talk a little more specifics about how the model kind of talks about that? That would be helpful. Yeah, sure. So there's there's two things that we want to think about. The first is, and would you mind, Aaron, Aaron, not, not wanting to interrupt the flow, but um, our tradition here is that you introduce yourself by name uh, before you testify. So thank you, uh, Aaron Strong. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, so there's two ways to think about this. The first is, or there's two portions that we want to think about this. The first is when we think about. Um, increasing revenue to the state through e or being able to pay for those subsidies to the early childhood sector what we're thinking is that would either come from increases in taxes in some sector whether that's a, a payroll tax a sale increase in the sales and use tax or or any of that or a decrease in expenditures in, in other areas so if i think about that on net what are we doing we're changing around the composition of income that's coming to the state which if I increase taxes, what does that do to consumers? That lowers their ability to buy goods, so that we'll, we, we will, in some sense, see a change in the composition of the economy because of this change in subsidies, change in family contributions, and changes in taxes. That, in essence, has a very minimal effect on the economy as a whole. It's it doesn't have an expansionary effect. It really just has a compositional effect. The second portion to that is, as we have um, uh, less costly from a family's perspective, early childhood education, that can induce um, participants to participate in the early childhood uh, education, put their children in child childcare, which allows them to participate in the, in the workforce. That second aspect is where that expansion is, li is likely to come from. As those workers join the labor force, um, 
And as new employment opportunities arise, we will get this expansion of the Vermont economy that not only will there be additional workers, there'll be additional um, machines and capital that will cause uh, this, this increase in income. Our estimates suggest that that expansion of the Vermont economy due to that increase in labor force participation is likely to be on the order of 60 to $200 million. So that's where the expansion is taking place. The expansion is taking place because of those that increased labor force participation. The, there is really no expansion taking place um, caused by the subsidy and financing system. That's really just a shuffling of the economy. Okay, thank you. And so your the determination, the modeling that you used was based on uh, Vermont data. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about how you have that the data that you used for that um, piece? Yeah, so so what we've what we've done is there's a there's a company out there called Implan. Mm -hmm. What Implan does is they take the Bureau of Economic Analysis data um, on 536 sectors and makes it specific to Vermont or any county in Vermont. And so what we've done is we've used 2019 data developed out of data from the U.S. Bureau of, um, sorry, BEA to, to, to calibrate the model um, that allows us to do these scenarios in terms of financing scenarios, in terms of labor force um, participation impacts all of that is done with Vermont-specific data calibrated to 2019. Okay, and then the issue, so it, it, it leaves alone the issue of the, the current inflationary pressures that we're feeling, as well as the changes in interest rates and so on, although I know Chris, you meant we're talking about that. I think this is an area that is gonna be uh, filled with uh, discussion going forward, but it's good for us to have an understanding in here. I yeah, what I would say is that we do okay. inflate those numbers to $2022 based on um, yes. Northeast specific um, uh, consumer yeah, price index. So we've, so we've taken into account the inflationary pressures from 2020, 2021, 2022 to account for that. Um, what we don't, what, 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 the, the most recent data that you have access to um, when we did the study was 2020, and we didn't think that 2020 was representative of what a long term um, uh, stable situation in Vermont was. And so we and felt we it was to use pre-pandemic data, data rather than use pandemic, pandemic data, which we thought might be flawed, flawed in, in terms of both the composition of the economy as well as the, 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 the level of the economy. And Lynn, did you want to throw in more? Yes, uh, hello, 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 also part of the uh, brand uh, team, uh, and uh, pleasure to be with you today. I just wanted to clarify, because I think I heard the question as framed as referring to overall impacts being small. And I just wanted to clarify that we do have a statement, I think it's on slide 33, but it's specifically referring to um, our estimates of household economic well-being which in which some ways is sort of a, sort of the, um, um, a concept that economists, economists use um, to assess the, the impact on um, households, households as consumers, consumers because, because of the changes, changes in things like taxes um, and, and the you know, economic, economic changes. changes. And to do that across the income distribution, distribution, to be able to, be able to see how, how well-being well changes at the lower end of the distribution and the higher end of the distribution. So that's just that's one just of one the economic, economic impact, impact measures that we look at, at where we where have we that have label relatively, relatively small. small. But I don't want to necessarily attach that to our findings with respect to um, you know, the fact that there we would expect um, some changes and in, increases in the labor force, increases in the overall size of the economy, and increases in tax revenues of the magnitudes that are, are referenced on the the next slide. So I just want to be clear that we're looking at different metrics of fiscal and economic impacts of the policy changes um, and uh, being clear about their magnitudes and how you might characterize them in terms of small or large. Well, thank you for that clarification. That's really helpful. And I, I know that this is an area of, of that at least our finance committee will be um, looking at but it, uh, as again i just want to say it's important for us to have some um, grounding here um, so 
I'm, not, I'm going to hold my next questions uh, for a minute. I know Senator Harding has questions. I know that Senator Weeks has questions. We each have questions. So, uh, Senator Harding, why don't you go ahead and uh, ask. Let's, let's, let's limit ourselves to one question, and then we'll, we'll try to uh, get the conversation for everyone going. Okay. Might be um, a follow-up on that. How much time do we, we have? We've got lots of time. We're good. Yes, till, tomorrow, till, too. Till 11. Okay. And then um, tomorrow as well, yeah. Okay. Well, then I'll take... Uh, the first question is sort of an uh, extension of what we were just talking about a little bit. In an, our earlier sort of briefing that we had with you guys in, the, I think, early December, yeah. maybe, um, I asked the question about um, whether you were going to try to model any kind of other impacts of the increase in access to early childhood education or the increase or the decrease in cost, something like you, I appreciate that you've mentioned the household economic well-being, but other sort of well-being metrics, and I know it's not quite in an economist's uh, yeah. uh, role, but um, the, the sort of long-term benefits of early childhood education on children and society, but also the benefits on families for, you know, less stress, more yeah. access to uh, the workforce, et cetera. Um, and I didn't see that. Was that something you were not able to get to? Well, so um, I'll take, there's two parts of your question. So yeah. like the long-term effects and then other effects. So um, we do have in the limitation section that there is a lot of evidence that early childhood, high quality early childhood education programs have a lot of long-term benefits for children and society. So we're talking about in K-12, it could reduce special education services. Um, it can lead to longer uh, total accumulation of education, um, better employment in the long term. The, the charge of the study too is look at a five year time period. So modeling those effects that would show up beyond those five years would be quite difficult considering you know, the, the specifics of the data that we have, but then also kind of beyond the scope of this study. So we do acknowledge in the report and, uh, that the, there are these long-term benefits. So you can kind of see this as a short-term investment that will pay off later, um, and that's going to be a decision for Vermont to make. Um, but there are long-term benefits that we couldn't, um, just for the, the kind of the scope of the study, mm -hmm. look at. Um, it is true also that you know having uh, care could help families in other ways. It's just very hard to measure mm -hmm. those ways, especially on an individual level and then at scale, and to somehow can I put that into like the economic model. So that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why that's also not in the report. But Lynn, um, I don't know if you have other uh, thoughts you want to add. Yeah, I'll just quickly add. It. Um, uh, Chris is is right that you know there's a broader research base that shows those benefits from participating. And especially I want to emphasize it's in high quality programs. Um, so just expanding access without attention to quality does not necessarily generate the kinds of returns that are talked about. Um, and second of all, that those benefits tend to be concentrated among children in lower income or lower resource um, situations. And so that's not to say that there aren't benefits as you move up the income ladder, but you know, it's an argument for why if you if you couldn't afford all of this at once, you would definitely want to start, you know, with lower income families and making sure that they have access to high quality and that the cost is not a barrier for them to have their children in um, these high quality early learning um, opportunities. So I just I think those are important aspects that um, potentially shape how you think about, um, you know, where you would make the investments, especially if it's not possible to do all of the investments um, at once. Okay, I, I, I appreciate that. And I know that you, Lynn, actually have done some of those studies. So I, <laughs> I, was, I was hoping they would be more referenced in this report so that to the extent that any a lot of people are going to be reading this report, which I know a lot of people already have, that those would be embedded more in the argument for, you know, beyond the sort of pure economic arguments, there are a lot more long-term and short-term 
benefits to investing in early childhood education. But I, I appreciate that you had a scope to stick to. Yeah. <laughs> I will say we didn't give as much attention to it in the presentation, partly because of time, but there is a discussion in the concluding chapter around these issues, pointing to some of that research and what those findings are. Um, my own reading and contribution to that literature is to be somewhat cautious that there are some estimates that I think overstate those potential benefits. Um, and so, for example, we reference um, returns on the order of two to four dollars for every dollar invested. Um, but those are typically benefits when we look at making these investments relative to no um, early learning, you know, um, high quality childcare, early learning experiences. And so it's important to put some of that um, evidence into the context of today's investments and where we think those, you know, those estimated returns really are. Yeah. What's the gain? You know, the gain is going to diminish as the, as you start higher and higher. So, uh, you okay for now? Or? Yeah, I have more questions, but yeah, I'll take my turn. We'll, we'll go around. Yeah. Um, Senator Weeks. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, excellent study. I uh, just had, uh, had one question about any assumptions. As trying to follow the thread through the uh, through the presentation. Uh, did does does the study assume that uh, given the uh, the uh, the demographic block of children you know, certain ages and such you know as they mature um, does it assume to develop the costs and what have you that uh, that a hundred percent of uh, children between age zero and five would be uh, are covered in the are covered in the study or is there an assumption that some families will raise their own children and and such. I just wonder, yeah. I didn't hear it, so I, maybe I missed it. No, that, that's a great question. So it assumes that 100% of, there will be enough money in the system that if you want the subsidy, you want to send your kid, you'll be allowed to. It does not assume 100% take up of that. Um, so we used, you know, looked into the literature to see what would be the likely take up given that. What is that? Uh, Lynn, do you have that number off the top of your head of the percent that would likely take up the policy? Um, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but I'll just say a couple of things. One is that the assumptions are that um, families would be making choices about how much care to consume. We know from existing data about the number of hours that children, families, you know, choose to purchase, if you will, of, of child care and early learning, um, that it's across the population, it's not 100%. It's much lower for infants. It grows a little bit for toddlers. And by the time children are one or two years away from kindergarten, typically we see around 75 to 80% of children at those ages um, participating in some form of early care and education, not necessarily at a full-time rate. Um, at the younger ages for infants, um, particularly for families where cost is not a constraint, um, we might see somewhere between 50 and 60% of infants in care, again, not necessarily at a full-time rate. So our assumptions are that, there, um, that participation grows as children age from birth to kindergarten entry, um, and that by removing essentially costs as a barrier because of the subsidies, we would see less of a difference across income levels in the consumption of early care and education than we do now. In other words, more of a convergence so that children at lower income levels would be participating um, in care in high quality early learning settings comparable to the participation rates of their higher income peers. Okay, I get all that. I, I heard it, but I'm still kind of searching for some, some assumption you used in the study to reach the final number. I mean, it all, the story was all the way through to the end. And so is the... So, I mean, I think the point Lynn was trying to say is that it's not one number, right? Because it's gonna vary, right? But about 50 to 60% for, for uh, for infants, and then probably Lynn, do you have the upper bound? I'm thinking for like kindergarten, for the grades, it's usually around eight percent. Yeah, exactly. So those are the numbers you use yeah. in your yeah. Okay, exactly. Sure. Okay, good. Gotcha. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good for that. Okay. Senator Williams, you want a question? Um, I, it's a lot of information, I, um, and I'm sure when I read it, I'm going to have different views on it. But one of the things that I heard was that, uh, that maybe I didn't, you didn't use any federal funding to come up with these calculations, or did you? We did. Okay. So we took into account all the federal funding that's currently in the system. So that $125 million number that is that we use that's currently in the system is a combination of the federal funds. So you get from Head Start, from Pre K, from the the Child Development uh, Block Grant, mm -hmm. um, and then also the state funds that you're currently appropriated into the system. Okay. And we subtract that from the total cost in order to get that gap. Right. I've been talking to a lot of constituents that in, were in the daycare business, and now they're not because of too much, too many regulations. Um, I guess that I get question I've got is, did you, did you, do we know what the average price at the ground level was? I mean, do we know what people were paying an average in mm -hmm. Vermont for daycare? Yeah, see. we do. It's it's around. Uh, Lynn, I think you have the exact number. It's around thirteen to fourteen thousand per year, I believe. Glenn, can you correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah, but I'll look it up. It's, in, yeah. it's documented in the report. I'll pull the number up while you're talking, just to confirm that. Yeah, and, and what they yeah, and, and if you look at the prices, they're kind of flat. Um, so it costs more to to have an infant and toddler in daycare than it does for a preschooler because you just need more adults in the room for that number, right? So what providers do often is they take that charge and they spread it across the different uh, ages so that they'll kind of undercharge, if you will, the what they relative to what they pay to provide that care for the infants and toddlers, but then they'll try to recoup that on the on the, the three and four year olds. And then uh, uh, pre but there, there's we in my town Again, looking at the local level, we have two systems. We got a we have a part time uh, pre K, yep. which most people use. A lot of people use as a daycare, and then you've got a full time, which is in the elementary school system. Um, and the, my understanding is the pre K uses federal funding. They're they're funded differently than the. Uh, so did you take that into consideration with this? Right, so uh, Act 166, which established the Universal Free Kindergarten Program in, and, um, in Vermont, is uh, those funds are already in there, um, as well as any federal funds that you get for the pre-K services as well. Okay. Yeah, it's a different funding. Yeah, I mean, so, the ECE yeah. system takes lots of different pots, right? It's, it's a little bit more complicated H than just like the K-12 system. Page 20 of your report has the yeah. full table of the funding sources. Oh, okay. so, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But I can't find the table of the, the cost, but lots of tables. <laughs> I don't think, yeah. I don't have it memorized yet. <laughs> the cost numbers are on page 15 in a paragraph that's in the middle of the page. They're not a table, um, but they are about $14,000. $14,000 a year for infants and toddlers and $13,000 for um, preschoolers. And that's for full-time annual cost of care. Yeah, it's a sticker price, not necessarily what it costs to buy. Right. Yeah, that, that, I should say, yes, those are the prices that parents pay, not necessarily what it costs the providers to deliver. Right. That's more of the stress that they're under. That's another table. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I would say, okay, so... Um, um, I'm just going to ask a question. I don't want to deviate the system here because everybody's got into you know interested in the discussion. But I'll ask a question that you might be able to go through with us tomorrow. Sure. How about that? Um, so the four-year phase-in review. So if we could look at the four-year phase-in for the different um, filling gap filling. Yep. That would be helpful yeah. to, to, to drill down into that a sure. little bit because we will spend time on that and just sure. committee. So that would be helpful. Yeah. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, and, yeah. We, and we give it to you all the different scenarios too. Right? Yeah, so if you that would be one, awesome. If you do option two, yeah. And in the in the presentation, we kind of gave you, we yeah. want to give you a, a big chart of numbers, right? And we said like a big hour going down. So in the report, there's like what happens at 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. So that would be you kind of see helpful. the progression of the taxes. And, and along those lines, Senator Weeks brought up the, the issue around um, the 
middle class as mm -hmm. compared with what we have here for going up to different levels of poverty. Is there a way, and I'm, I'm looking at Nolan, maybe this is something you could get us for Vermont, where, where the, or Joyce maybe, where the middle class is, a bell curve, a middle class income, get an income distribution, and then how that fits with um, the federal poverty level that we're talking about between 100% and maybe 500% because I think that's what's in the report. Yeah. Can yeah. We, yeah. If we could get that, that'd be, that would be terrific. I'll, I'll connect with Joyce to see if there's something we can do. Yeah. I, yeah. I know I've, I've seen that information and somewhere. The federal poverty guidelines also give it um, by family size, right? So, yes. for example, five times poverty for a family of three is 115,150. Yeah. But then for a family of four, that goes up to 138,755. Uh, yes. So it's also depends on your family size. Oh, no, there you go. <laughs> it's here, but you're you're right. It is. It, it does distinguish between uh, family size and that's really Yeah, in this case. Okay. Oh. Are we are we doing more questions? We are. Um, um, so. Um, Fifteen more minutes. I've asked I have for, for my information, so we're going to move back to Senator Hardy. Okay. And when when Senator Gullick comes in, she gets. So, okay, I'll ask two, my two last questions, and if we don't get to them today, then we can do. But um, the one is about you, the report goes up to 350%. You, did you model out of poverty? Did you model out the potential of going higher? And um, because I'm concerned about the cliff at 350, yeah. I mean, it's pretty stark on your, yeah. your chart. Um, and um, uh, what it would take to sort of yeah. smooth it out up to maybe 500 percent or where so we decide. so we do um, go up to 500 percent. We model out 500 yeah. percent. Okay. So with those larger gap estimates of about 270 to 280 million dollars a year. Uh -huh. That models it up to uh, 500 uh, percent of the okay. level. And so the largest gap estimate, I think, which is around 280 million dollars, caps it at. Um, 13, so it goes, caps it at 7% if you're 350 or below, and then it goes up and caps it at 13% if you're both between 350 and 500. So even at the 500% level, you're contributing 13% of your salary. Okay, and the 7%, did you, you where, can you remind me where you Yeah, so the, the last schedule says if you're 350% or below, uh -huh. you cap it at 7, uh -huh. and then for 350 to 500, you increase, but you cap it up at 13%. Okay, and are those uh, the seven to thirteen percent? Are those just ranges that worked, or is there some research behind those percentages? Yeah, what we try to do is, I mean, Lynn, if maybe you can provide a little more context on that. But yeah, they're kind of within the, the ranges of what you would ex want to expect that somebody of that economic well-being or okay. income level would. But Lynn, would you want to talk to more about that? Sure, and let me just also note that Schedule 3 um, uses the 10% cap all the way up to five times poverty. Um, so what, what was a little unclear as we were reading um, Act 45 and the um, desire to have a cap on the share of family income that would go toward the cost of child care and early learning programs was whether that 10% cap or the 7% cap would apply um, past the current threshold of 3.5 times poverty. So on the 10% cap, we actually did it both ways. So schedule two is what we focus on um, in the presentation and sort of view that as, as our um, as our main estimate, if you will, but there is a version um, schedule three, which is somewhat more generous in that that 10% cap applies all the way up to five times um, poverty. And one of the things you'll notice is that under these schedules that we use, which get successively more generous, in other words, families paying less of the cost and more of the cost would fall to the public sector, is that we're not changing, you know, each of those um, sort of lowering of the rates and moving up the income ladder is having incremental changes in, you know, overall of maybe the $20 million that we mentioned at one point. And part of that is that 
um, you know, we're moving through a range of the income distribution um, that is relatively uh, fewer families as percentage of all families compared to those below 3.5 times poverty or even at five times poverty um, and above. So some of these changes, um, you know, represent relatively small increments and the amount of public sector funding that that would be required. And if you look at the report, there's a fairly detailed breakout that shows you going from 3.5 times poverty up to four, then 4.5 and five. So you can sort of see at each of those increments how much more um, the public sector contribution would be, or conversely, how much less the family contribution would be. So what that's picking up in each sort of segment of the income distribution as you as you move higher. Okay, so this the at 150 percent or 1.5 percent of poverty um, is uh, is that the seven percent? You do start at seven no. there because no, the, the under 150 percent there's no family contribution. There's no, no family contribution. So that would be zero yeah. percent essentially. So seven yeah. percent starts at 150 percent of poverty. Right? Yes. No, no, and a hundred, so this is, I don't know, Chris, if you could put up that chart. I am exactly, it's exactly what I'm doing. Okay, what, right. which chart? So is what it? you'll see yeah, when Chris spot. puts the chart right. up is, is essentially it's flat until 1.5 times poverty. Then it starts at around 2%, um, and then it goes 3%, 4%, and so on, up to that 10% threshold um in uh at 3.5 times poverty and then it continues to increment under some schedules and, and other schedules it's held flat so you can see that um the flat line between zero and 150 percent of poverty um the arrow that that chris is using there that's where it's no contribution okay. then under the current ccfap schedule that's the higher line that's both green and black and red yeah um, and that so it, it actually hits um, about 10%. Again, this is for families of three um, at more like 2.5 times poverty. Um, and so the current schedule goes above 10% um, for the smaller families. And that's because it's a flat dollar contribution within a given um, uh, ratio of income to poverty, regardless of family size. So that flat contribution is a larger percentage when families are smaller, like size three and size four compared to the five and size five and six families. Um, so that's why these are plotted for a family of size three where these percentages are essentially maxed out. Um, so, you, so it is a it's a it's a sliding scale fee um, across the income distribution and then it gradually goes up and in some cases it's capped. And then and depending upon these schedules, the two schedules four and five what they do is that regardless of family size, it's always a fixed percentage rather than a fixed dollar amount. So regardless of family size, those two blue schedules, which are the lowest shifted down, it's always 2% for between 150 and 175. And then it goes to 3% between 175 and 200, you know, and so on. So those are always the same percentage, regardless of family size within a given point on the income distribution. And because we were aiming for a 10% cap on the um, schedule four, it's a little bit above um, schedule five, which was aiming for a 7% cap, again, applied at 3.5 times poverty. We do allow it then to continue to rise. You could convert those also to a flat schedule at 10% or um, at 7%, you know, beyond 3.5 times poverty. Any of those shifts, right. you know, essentially it's more area under the curve that the public sector will be picking up rather than families contributing. And you're assuming uh, family contributions regardless of yeah. number of children, not individual yeah. child yeah. contributions. Okay. Um, so all right, do you, where in the actual the report is this, um, that the table that you, no, I think it might be good to come back to this again tomorrow. So okay. To, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying don't ask that question now. I'm just saying that in addition to looking at the um, phase-in, 
it would be helpful to look at this again so we can solidify our thinking yeah. about it. The one, the one thing I would, I would point is that the, in the report, the, the lines aren't as nice and curved. Yeah. It's exact a little bit um, because yeah. of the way that the schedule, the salary schedules yeah. are. Um, or the, uh, the contribution schedules. So for the stylistically, we kind of smooth it out here, so yeah. we get the, the higher points. But just if you're going to try to look for that, it's going to be a little bit different. Okay. Um, and then the chapter three section, the cost study section. Okay. Um, the the other question I have, which we can talk about more tomorrow, is that I th I think what in your analysis you're assuming the same structure that we have now in the overall early child care system. So you don't make changes to the number of hours for UPK or any kind of changes. Well, we, in uh, we, we, we model the number of hours that people would ask for based on the revised subsidy schedule. So we don't necessarily say that you're going to change UPK or the, the way which providers are going to provide that extra, but we are assuming an increased number of hours that are going to be beyond uh, the ten hours that are that are. Yeah, so we don't we don't really look at it as saying you're going to take ten hours of UPK and then five hours of, of private uh -huh. center care. We're going to say these are the total number of hours that they're going to ask for. Um, they're going to have to be provided in some way, and you can perhaps do that through the expansion of the UPK system, for example. But we don't necessarily say that this is where those hours are going to come from for UPK. Universal UPK. Program. Universal UPK. Sorry. Yeah, I loved, I think it was your comment about we didn't look at property taxes because it's too complicated. Or and our, I mean, our data is not. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to look at property taxes. I got a chuckle there. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay for now. Senator, sure. Okay, yeah. so, um, Senator Reeves, did you have anything for I, I do. I'm still uh, back on Absolutely. assumptions. I'm, I'm, yeah, 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 but, uh, yeah, that's okay. And, and, and if I say something, I, we go into acronyms a lot, so like if someone doesn't understand, please let us know. Yeah. Thank you, though. I appreciate that. Okay, so assumptions. Uh, education uh, requirements for health or for child care providers, uh, lead teacher, bachelor's degree, assistant teacher, associate's degree. Uh, these are, I assume, these are all the contact uh, teachers. These are not, this is not the support staff, that's that's elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, how does this compare to maybe, you know, federal requirements or other states, other certificate programs, you know, which are used for the assistant teacher level? Right. Uh, so, contact? so what the purpose of the report is to model high quality care. So there's a couple of things. So for example, federal programs like Head Start and a lot of uh, UPK, universal pre-K programs in different states require that bachelor's level for the lead teacher. Mm -hmm. um, it's also shown that you know the, the extra skills that they get by pursuing a bachelor's um, for the whole child to like understand child development as well as how to teach the child is really helpful in providing that high quality care. So the charge of Act 45 is say, how much is this high quality care going to cost? So we yeah. made those levels to assume that. But that is commensurate with accreditation standards. That's commensurate with um, requirements for other care like Head Start. And it is also commensurate with what the direction other states are moving in. OK, very good. Yeah. Um, and I may have missed it in the presentation, but when you're talking about gaps, um, this is taking into account all the federal money that we've got right now. Is, was there any other factors brought in with how, how we would fill the gaps? So what we did is we, we enumerated all the money into the system from all the different, right? And then we, we calculated how much money is it going to cost. And so that gap is what's going to have to be funded by Vermont. Um, and so those seven or those six options, basically, and they're options, right? They're not prescriptions about different combinations of taxes that could be used to fill that gap is, is what we did and that's what we modeled uh, on the wider the economy um, but of course you know you're free it's, it's a basis right for you to make off your just to make your decisions you might want to go in that direction you may want to go in another direction that's completely up to you so you didn't factor in any uh, employers contributions we factored the core contributions to what? To, to the right. I think I can help that, Senator. If, I think if you go to slide, Chris, maybe if you pull up. Yep. Let, let's ask it a different way, but let's so let's continue with slide that. 25, and I think this kind of gets at the okay. cost of the system, and then you have, the, there's an assumption around the family contribution, and then how much is existing in the system, and then you have, what's left is the funding gap, 
that's the financing part where they offer a menu of options. So they took into consideration multiple funding options for you to consider. So they're not assuming that there's a payroll tax in the assumption. They're saying there's a $258 million gap. Here's a menu of ideas and how you'd like fill that. And that mm -hmm. might include so for example, the payroll task could be played by the employer or the employee. So that's like one of the, the options that we model. So, and so I think, Lynn, do you still have your, you have a question, your hand up to, uh, for yeah, this? Yeah, okay. add something. Oh, Go right ahead. Okay. Um, so I, I think um, we viewed our charge as looking at state revenue sources that could help fill the gap. Um, but having worked with other states, um, you know, there are some other strategies and certainly even for, for Vermont, some of these are relevant. Um, and we, we reference this also in, in the concluding uh, chapter. One is the possibility that there will eventually be new federal funds um, allocated to this system. Um, so the federal government has been, you know, increasing the amount of money of the federal dollars in the child care development fund, um, which is, you know, then allowed states to either add to that or make their own decisions about how much more they want to add. And that was certainly part of um, the um, original um, Build Back Better. Um, plan was an increase in, in federal funding. So if that comes along, that would reduce um, the burden that the state would pick up or the, the, the gap that the state would need to um, pick up. Um, there's always the option of reallocating state budgets. Um, so if there are areas of spending that you can identify to re reduce current um, state spending that you could allocate without raising taxes to this area, that would be another possibility. Some states have also looked to see if there are ways that they can be even more efficient in the use of the dollars that they have in this area um, to um, see that more of the monies are spent directly on care. Um, so um, that might mean uh, being more efficient in how subsidies are administered. Um, or other um, administrative costs in the system. And I should also mention in the context of federal dollars, some states have found that they underutilize the federal dollars that they have access to. Um, in other words, in every year, they're not spending out the full allocation of the federal block grant or optimizing the ability to shift funds from TANF into childcare. So those were not options that we directly considered. Um, and they, you know, may have less relevant in Vermont than in some of the other states I've worked in, but I just want to mention um, that, you know, as part of your deliberations, those may be something else, you know, you all want to look into. Thank you. That's good. Uh, so, uh, quick question. Um, I know that, uh, I think Senator Hardy brought up the issue around, you know, value, quality. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, you um, high quality child care and the implications of that just to give us that general concept i think that's an important thing for us to understand why are we doing this why what's what's financing financing is one thing but um maybe talk a bit about the what high quality child care is and its value sure um so we talked a little bit about in the presentation kind of those cost drivers so when we talk about high quality care you're talking about cost uh the ratios between teachers and kids so that te the kids can get enough attention from each of the teachers so you don't want really large ratios. We're talking about things like yeah. uh, making sure that the curriculum you use are evidence-based, making sure that teachers have enough professional development opportunity to further their skills as the field progresses, um, and it also things um, such as making sure that you have rigorous oversight and assessments of the quality of the care through the STARS program, for example. Yeah. So these are some of those features. And, and the reason why you really want high quality care, something that Lynn said before, is that just mere access to pre-K that's not necessarily high quality won't necessarily get you those benefits, particularly the ones that Senator Hardy was talking about, those long-term benefits that a child in society can improve over the long term. That it's really that these high quality care that, that really talks about how do you support the development of the child intellectually, emotionally in those early years because nurturing those types of things in the early years is what sets the foundation for learning and being successful in the long run. So really making sure that the high quality looks at that is what can capture those benefits um, in the long run. But Lynn, I'll, I'll let you add something if you'd like. 
Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that this all comes from a very um, deep base of research, um, especially in the child development field, but we've also seen a convergence where evidence from neuroscience, for example, has informed our understanding of um, the importance for brain development during these early years, um, what's actually happening in the brain based on children's experiences, contacts with adults, with peers, um, the shape of those environments that they're in and the role that they play um, in preparing children for school, but also setting a foundation for social emotional development as well as cognitive development. Um, and so on. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that this is um, a very extensive base of research around child development that informs our understanding of what high quality looks like and then what the benefits are of that, that high quality. Yeah, and, and just to kind of reiterate what Senator Harden said is that you know, these are long-term benefits that we'll see, right? Absolutely. So it's hard to quantify that in a short-term study over five years, but yeah. you are setting the stage for the future of the children. So yeah, the whole brain and behavior and neurodevelopmental areas are so critical. Yeah, um, exactly. The, the brain is most malleable. One of the favorite young. courses I ever developed and taught. Uh, yeah. And, with, and currently, there are some folks out there who have benefited from that. Mm -hmm. Let's hope the kids are benefiting as well. Um, it, uh, this is an area that we don't talk enough about, and then what um, what the what the benefits are. So, good. And anything you want to add tomorrow on that would be really helpful. Just Go one ahead. quick. Uh, similarly, the workforce impact. Yeah, you estimated the number of potential new workers in the workforce, and then the the tax impact of increased collection of taxes because of the increased number of workers. Does that increase tax, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm gonna ask anyway. Does that increased tax amount also include the potential increased tax amount for the increase in salaries for childcare workers themselves? Okay, excellent, I thought so. And then the, is there any way to measure the, or did you measure the workforce benefits to the child care workers themselves or the, the sector itself to having higher wages and compensation? So we model it in terms of having the general statewide, you know, gross state product and then the increased revenue bases. Um, the I mean, the, the workforce is a relatively small share of yeah. the Vermont, right? So, you know, in aggregate, you're talking about short people with higher wages would be better off kind of financially, emotionally, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, again, those are kind of hard to measure, so they're not yeah. their fiscal models, but to the extent that they then contribute to the Vermont economy in, mm -hmm. in bigger ways because they have more income, mm -hmm. that is modeled. And Aaron, I'll let you add something if, if you'd like. Just one thing to add to that. Yes, within the early childhood uh, education sector, there will be increases in wages. But because of the way that we've modeled the financing of this, there will be a decrease in disposable income by all families due to those increases in taxes. And there will potentially be a decrease in disposable income by those families that are, particip that are participating in early childhood that weren't. And so on net, all of that will in some sense net out to be roughly zero. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Terrific. Okay, well, um, Senator, welcome back. Um, why don't you introduce yourself to, to Chris Doss, and there's others up on the screen. I'm Marty Mark Hewlett. I'm a senator from Burlington, uh, the Chittenden Central District, and I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you for having us. And, and actually, what I'm going to suggest is that um, Senator Gulick will have questions, and she can uh, if you have them right now, that'd be great. And some of the, we've asked some things that they're going to bring back to us tomorrow for a broader discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's been a, it's been a good, this has been great. My only question was the one around the middle class. Okay. And yeah, everything good. else I just need to take some time to process. I think you asked us. if you're about that, right? So, for tomorrow, she can talk. Oh, yeah. oh, tomorrow, okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, any other burning questions at this point? Do we have time or? 
Yeah, I was going to say, let's take another three or four minutes. I, I, I know that um, some of us have obligations at 12 o'clock, so it'll give us a few minutes before that. Wait, isn't it 10.49 right now? It's 10.50. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. What are we okay. doing from 11 to 12? Do we oh, we have, um, oh, we have something else? Hello. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, we just want to have a little break be before Ina comes in. That's all. Oh, oh, we have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I was getting, I was getting lost. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Not really. But so, um, maybe a relatively easy question, but uh, you, in the presentation, you, you noted that um, that that uh, special needs children account for roughly ten percent of overall children. Okay. In their early childhood years. Right. Okay. And um, they stated that um, uh, essentially the estimate was uh, if special needs children are accounted for in the in the study cost study that that would uh, amount to about a one percent increase in the estimate and such. Is this is this recognizing that that the special needs uh, children population often require a one-on-one -on -one educator to child ratio right well so special needs is also a spectrum so on the severely disabled and then there's some. so yes that that cost kind of takes so all those and bundles into like one average okay so you're pretty confident about the one percent estimate increase of it's it's yes and um also something to note that you would add some of the special needs money into the total cost of in the system that 125 million dollar number would increase a little bit as well because we didn't specifically model the okay. extra costs for special needs, we didn't put in that extra money that's currently in the system yeah. as well. See that extra money, that's, to me, you know, you know there's layers of money. Yes. And I just want to make sure that in the end, you know, you had a very nice summary graph of, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's currently funded and so right. That number really does represent like all the contributors to uh, this facet. And, and I'm not, I'm not in any way degrade, uh, denigrating the, the, the quality of the, of the study. It's, it's phenomenal. Just want to make sure that when we're talking about current state money or federal money, that we're accounting for all the layers, not just. Uh, and this is an area that's difficult because we have children's integrated services where there's been some funding changes and how that is how that is applied, and it doesn't all go to child care centers; it goes to different places. So, and I don't know whether you even got into that the CIS bit or not, but. Um, and, and so I can we can understand I guess why that wasn't included as a larger in a larger discussion and Linda, special uh, accommodation grants and so on. Yeah. Sure. Sure. yeah. Linda, do you want to say something? Yeah, I'll, I'll just reiterate that our estimate, the 125 million dollars, does not include the federal funds that come through IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act either through part C, which is for children zero to three, um, which um, in Vermont falls under the uh, CIS umbrella or for part B funding, um, which is for preschool age children. So those funds are not being counted as part of the system, leaving them available should you wanna increase that number to account for what would be the incremental cost over an already high quality system to serve children with that full range of, of special needs, those funds would be still in, you know, available to help cover um, those costs, um, both across that continuum from birth to kindergarten entry. Um, so just want to be, be clear about that. And, you know, part of it is a complex sort of set of uh, funding streams and not all of it is um, the equivalent of providing child care and early learning some of it is for other kinds of um, you know special medical care and and other outside of um, those kinds of care setting services and supports for for children in those early years so because it's difficult to separate that out we didn't want to confound funding that's being used for other purposes in with our estimates for um, directly for early care and education. Yeah, so that would be, that would probably be uh, for us something to consider in the next step, how it all fits into whatever we do this year is uh, probably difficult. You know, it, it will be difficult to, 
pull it all together. I know it's a concern out in the community. And, and so I think another thing to point out just quickly is that, you know, there's very much an interest in inclusive approaches to education, even in those uh, ages three and four, a year or two before kindergarten entry. And the kind of um, estimates we have for high quality um, ECE would be consistent with inclusive settings. Um, where children with special needs are included in the classrooms with their typically developing peers. And the assumptions we make, for example, around compensation would be sufficient to um, recruit and retain teachers with bachelor's degrees in special education in the, in the early years. So that's one of the reasons why that incremental cost is you know, relatively small, 10% overall, because we've already assumed a very high level of teacher qualifications and compensation. Okay. One last one last question. I don't have a question. It's just oh, a comment. Just a comment. Yeah. 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 Because I, I um, even though I hear you, you know, wanting to have the special education funding <laughs> included in it, I think it makes sense that you have not included in it because, uh, as I think Senator Lyon said, it's often for very specialized services for individual kids, not as a as a sort of access to child care directly mm -hmm. um they they may be accessing those services within the setting of a child care center or pre-k or whatever but the the funding is for the services to uh address a disability a specific disability not access to child care so right. it does right. i think makes and, sense and that's that's a very good way to, to approach it and uh, but it is also Difficult when if you're in, in the child care center, so I'm going to say something. Yeah, no, I just, uh, you know, given the 10% estimate of children with special needs and given the continuum of course, I just want to make sure that uh, that 1% that estimate was really reflective and, and those costs were embedded there or somewhere else. That's all. Yeah. I'm not, no, no, no agenda. I think we're going to call it a wrap for today, and then um, we'll be back. I think this, this today gives us additional time to go through the report, look at your slides again, and bring more questions. Aren't you glad? <laughs> and, and then uh, we also had asked some for some more specific information. And I'll go ahead. Two things. One, um, does anybody need a hard copy of the report? Yeah, hey, I, oh, I just. I asked, I, I asked the copy. Oh, I have some on me. Yeah, I would love a copy. I think we all, in this in this room, I think we all deserve to have hard copy. I already have one. Okay. Well, here, I agree on it. If you lose it, then that's true. And just keep those copies and just give them back and give them another feedback. Gotcha. Thanks. Are you the only one here in person? Yes. Did you draw the short straw? I am the. Closest physically to uh, the see. Line. And Alex, you sent us that PowerPoint, right? Uh, yes, it is. It's, it's on our it's on our web page. Gotcha. And it's posted with notes. Yeah. Like that's right there. Yeah. It's, uh, it's terrific. Or, uh, it's terrific. So, thank you, Lynn. Same. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, we're gonna go uh, off Thanks off the line now. Oh, and then yeah. we're, we're back tomorrow, so if you have more questions. Yeah. Yay. So Chris. everything you missed, we'll just redo it all again. Okay. <laughs> I was so going to have you guys give me a skinny. We are offline. Thank you. Thanks, Aww. Alex. All right, so this is Senate Health and Welfare Committee. We're back live on January 18th, and we're moving uh, from child care to health care reform and looking at the all-payer model, and we have with us the Director of Healthcare Reform uh, in the Agency of Human Services, Ina Backus, and Ina, welcome. You have, I don't think you've been here yet this year, so we have a new committee, and uh, so we're gonna have the committee introduce themselves. We'll start with you, um, Senator Gullick. Hello, I'm here to meet I'm a senator from, I live in Burlington, and I'm from Chittenden Central. And nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you here. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Dave Weeks, uh, Roman County, uh, live in Proctor. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. 
Name. Terry Williams from Rockland County, rather than Paul. All right, and Senator Hardy will be in, and you, uh, you know her from previous years, so this is great. Yes. So, thank you for being here. Um, why don't you introduce yourself for the record, and then we would really like to hear. Do you have uh, something to share up on the screen? Or? I did send to, uh, app. should I join the meeting? Sure. Yes, you can. Yeah. And share. Yeah, that'd be good. I would be happy to do that. For the record, my name is Ina Backus. I'm the Director of Healthcare Reform at the Agency of Human Services. I am the outgoing director, and I'll be joining uh, Senator Welch's team starting next week, working in the Vermont office. Congrats. Um, it's nice, but it's nice to meet you today, nice. and hopefully we'll see you in a different capacity in the future. Uh, I am from, so while I'm, you'll see how poorly I do with multitasking as I join and speak. Um, <laughs> we don't believe that for a no. minute. Mm -mm. I uh, live in Montpelier, but I grew up in Bristol, Vermont, um, New Haven, Bristol area. It's a pretty part of the state. Yeah, it is a pretty part of the state. I think of like Chittenden, now that I live in Montpelier, Chittenden County feels like a banana boat. Like, so it's like warm and nice. Uh. <laughs> Lake effect. Mm. I'm in Chittenden County. No. And of course, I grew up in Addison County, but that whole the side of the state. Okay. Okay, so I will. Share my screen. And so, just so you know, while you're getting that up for us, um, the the new members of the committee are told, don't haven't had uh, experience with most of what we're doing here. So, we'll, okay, we'll have some basic questions as we go through. But we've got two things here for us. One is the all payer model, and the other is the healthcare workforce update, which um, I'm thrilled that we can, we can look at. Both of them are just great. You know, there's a lot of interest in both. So which one we're starting out with? Um, I don't know why I'm having difficult. I was just, I, um, I'll try screen sharing one more time. I'm sorry. Yes. I was okay. just, doing it in the other committee. I'm not sure what's happening here. Okay. Share. Okay. I think it. Great. Is there something up there? Yes. Yes. Are we starting with all payer or with workforce? It's your preference. Either works. Um, let's start with all payer and then we'll go to workforce. Um, and just so you know, uh, it would be great if we could wrap up probably with five minutes to spare. That would be helpful. Okay. And I see that I'm joined by my colleague, Wendy Trafton, on yes, the terrific. remote. I would to welcome her as well. Yeah, good. And if you'd like to introduce her to the record, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Wendy Trafton, and I'm the Deputy Director of Healthcare Reform within the Agency of Human Services. Thank you. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Really. You may get some questions. Okay. Um, so the intent of our conversation today um, is to talk about um, to talk about Act 167 of 2022, which asked that the Director of Healthcare Reform, um, which asked that the Director of Healthcare Reform uh, continue work to uh, explore a potential future all payer model agreement and we're we're moving to calling this multi-payer model as we have our conversations with our federal partners and in fact Act 167 uses the terminology multi-payer which is great but I know that 
people have heard a lot about the all-payer agreement, and we do have a contract with the federal government today that is called the Vermont All-Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement. Um, but as we continue, and as we continue to talk about this with other folks, you'll hear the term multi-payer being used more frequently. You know, 167 asks that the Director of Healthcare Reform collaborate with the Green Mountain Care Board to uh, con uh, continue to look at um, and develop a proposal for what a future or subsequent agreement with our federal partners um, would look like and what the state would want to propose. Now, I'll back up a little bit to just give a very high level explanation of the agreement that we have today. We, um, since 2016, the state of Vermont has a, had a contract with the federal government so that Medicare can pay differently for health care in the state of Vermont, and it does that through an accountable care organization model. The contract has three signatories, the, uh, the governor, the secretary of the Agency of Human Services, and the Green Mountain Care Board. All three of those signatories agree that in exchange for Medicare doing its business differently in the state of Vermont, that the state of Vermont will meet a number of requirements including that the Green Mountain Care Board uh, sets the rate that Medicare grows in this model. The Green Mountain Care Board helps to define how Medicare um, pays and aligns with other of the payers in the model. Uh, and the Agency of Human Services, which is where I work, the Director of Healthcare Reform, but also has six departments. I think you've had the introduction. Um, the Department of Vermont Health Access, one of the agency's six departments, is and administers the Medicaid ACO program, which is aligned in this all-payer model that we have, and we are required to offer that program by this state-federal agreement. And then the state-federal agreement really strongly encourages that commercial payers in the state also pay differently for health care in this model. And the reason that we have used this terminology all payer in the past, the reason why we'll continue to use a multi-payer terminology going forward is because fundamentally we're talking about shifting the payment model for health care services and the payment model in the United States there are numerous payers, so so many different payers that contract with providers, Co commercial insurers, Medicare and Medicaid represent three broad categories of payers, and the model is trying to get those three broad categories of payers to align in a different reimbursement model for healthcare services. That's can you just, you're, are you, I'll ask you, are you going to talk about a distinction between fee-for-service and, and our multi-payer system? I can absolutely do, I, it's, I don't have it in this presentation, but I have it in another one, and I yeah. toggle, I could show a slide even, that would be helpful if you yeah. want. Just a, a quick explanation of the differences would be helpful, and we'll be on the same page. Because when you say multiplayer, it means one thing to me, but it might mean something unknown to somebody. Uh, someone said on page 17. Yeah, one of your colleagues just took the. Okay. You know, thank you very much. Though. Appreciate that. I love that you said colleagues. That's how sweet. Kind of make them feel professional. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Can you, it, can, you, can you all see this? Yes. Yeah. This, this is something that's called, uh, it's, it's such a boring name. It's a learn, <laughs> learning action network um, payment, alternative payment model framework. 
And this learning action network is, is something, it was set up by partly by the Affordable Care Act and it supports the federal government and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which Vermont works with really regularly to think about um, alternative to fee for service. And it was really set up because the Affordable Care Act anticipated that in order to bring health care costs under control in the United States that we would need to explore and consider a lot of different models of reimbursement other than fee, just the fee-for-service reimbursement model. And so the Learning and Action Network set about to create a framework of if it's our goal to move away from fee-for-service, here's a framework of different categories of healthcare payment models that are moving away from fee-for-service. But the essential point is that with the fee-for-service reimbursement model, that model pays for healthcare services that are administered. They are, there's a payment for each and every service that's administered, each and every service that's billed. And that payment is provided regardless of whether the service is contributing to better health outcomes, regardless of whether the service um, is, is a high quality service or the most appropriate service in, in the right setting of care. And again, the Learning Action Network and federal partners all hypothesize that that needs to change in order for their, the healthcare system to better meet the needs of individuals in our country. And here in Vermont, we hypothesize that to be the case for the citizens of our state. So then we would want to start to move away from the fee-for-service reimbursement model to a model that does reimbursement, that does have a link to quality and value for people. And there are three categories of payments that, have, that can be defined as having links to quality and value. And that includes investing more in category two, investing more in quality performance, in paying fee for service, but in accompanying that with bonus payments for quality or accompanying that with infrastructure payments for um, supporting, uh, let's say, primary care providers in offering more comprehensive care and connecting to community-based care. And then there's also, in terms of the healthcare payment and reimbursement system, um, there's a strong theory that risk and holding holding risk is an important component in um, in better managing overall costs for the system, and that if more risk is transferred to healthcare providers rather than sitting with third party payers exclusively that the healthcare providers will have a stronger incentive to provide the most high quality, most appropriate care versus any care that, you know, any, any care and they're going to be reimbursed for that regardless. The other key component of why we want to test this move away from fee-for-service is that fee-for-service is a very rigid model and it's based around how how providers and their particular services are kind of um, valued uh, relative to the time it takes to, to perform the service, the training, the materials needed for the service, and so on and so forth. But the reality is that providers' time in speaking with their colleagues um, about best practices, providers time and following up with people by phone, checking in with their patients, having enough time to sit with their patients and have a complete kind of conversation and understand and look people in the eye and, and provide for care. Those things are not typically reimbursed. So there's no payment for spending your time that way. So that's another that's another motivating factor in moving away from the fee-for-service model. And when you move all the way into category four, 
which is the furthest from fee for service and is really setting a budget for providers, a predictable payment for taking care of a population of individuals, then um, again, the hypothesis is that really allows for more flexibility for providers to, um, to meet the needs of their patients in the most appropriate way. And I think it's, you know, this, this is how the system has been set up and any individual provider is not, you know, they're always, for the most part, always working in the clinical best interests of their patients, but they are working in a system that may limit their time with a patient, that may mean that any opportunity they have to make a phone call to a patient isn't until 11 p.m. at night when they've finished all their other paperwork. Yes. So there's system. The system is what we're really looking at. You know, we're looking at the lens of reforming the system so that it can be, um, so that it has, a, it is a better working environment for clinical individuals to provide the best possible care. And for the patients too, right? Yes. Yes, yes, the first objective is to improve the patient experience of care. Yeah. Yes. Cost, quality, access. Yes. And quality includes how you experience care in the system. Just like child care. I know, it's like, oh, themes. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> We're that. So why don't we just go back and, and we'll, I, I think ultimately we'll all have a discussion in here. Yes. Sort ourselves out somehow. Great. So we're we we've been working in this in this model um, to move away from fee for service. That's the basic premise of the model: moving away from fee for service. Um, and that contract has been in place. It has um, five performance years in the original agreement, and it included one year that was like called a year zero and wasn't a performance year. So it was twenty. Um, I actually have a quick. If you don't mind me toggling back and forth between presentations, there's a timeline um, of the original agreement term. We're currently in, in an extension of this agreement uh, because of a, a couple of key factors. Um, our agreement and the timeline for us to propose a future potential agreement happened to be in the time that we had a global health pan or we had a pandemic, uh, and we still do. Uh, so with that made um, the work that we needed to do with stakeholders and with Vermonters um, and certainly thinking about who, the providers who were already experiencing this change in the system and wanting them to be able to come to the table to think about what's next, we needed to delay that work. So that's why we have an extension of this current ag agreement. Um, and we have an additional uh, year. We're in an active extension now, and we're likely to, we're, we will be offered an additional year, and that is because our federal partners anticipate that a new model wouldn't be available until 2025. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the presentation that's the update. Um, Good, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for digressing. I'm happy to, as long as uh, you don't mind me like, toggling back and forth here. Um, and don't move as fast in Zoom. Every time I'm like, am I doing it right? <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so we have been tasked now with, that we have an extension, we've been tasked with doing the work that I just referred to to think about a future potential model. And I wanted to highlight the work that we initiated over the summertime with a healthcare, what we're, what's called the healthcare reform work group. And that work group is and has been, and we'll walk through what, what work it did over summer and fall, um, looking at a future financial and care model. That's that, it's, we're thinking of it as a future financial and care model. But I did want to make sure that the committee understood that in order for us to even to really get to that work, we also had to spend some time with healthcare stakeholders addressing some very short-term stability issues. The pandemic certainly uh, disrupted, as 
everyone knows all you know, all aspects of life, but then had some very particular disruptions to the healthcare system. And it's been important that we spend time strategizing about some things that can be done in the short term to alleviate the pressures that have come to bear on the system. And we also talked about some of the impact of the federal regulatory environment and how that is, uh, and, and that environment is um, in some ways uh, uh, exacerbating those pressures by, by cuts to home health providers, for example, by sunsetting um, some really helpful waivers that allowed skilled nursing facilities to be able to meet the needs of their residents and patients in some more creative ways. Now they cannot do that because the waivers that were in operation during the pandemic have closed and we are, and other states and other places are struggling too. So we've advocated with our federal partners about those regulatory changes that are creating continued challenge and pressure. Uh, and then talking about the financial and care model that we would want to pursue in the future if uh, we want to continue having Medicare be a part of all payer reforms. Uh, just a very high level summary of the, what the work group did um, in terms of the summertime work. They generated recommendations um, in terms of short-term stability in these key areas, and you can certainly dive deeper into that um, as you choose as uh, in future conversations. But I'm I'm highlighting this here, um, and then moving to the financial and care model. So that's what Act One Sixty Seven was precise in asking us to do is develop that future potential all-payer, multi-payer model um, and to, and to uh, propose a subsequent agreement for Medicare's participation. And Medicare's participation in paying differently is really critical um, with Medicare, you know, being for many hospitals uh, in the state, you know, Medicare represents 33, 39% of their total revenue. Green Mountain Care Board has a great chart that lays out what, how much revenue from Medicare each and every hospital in the state receives. If we're thinking about paying differently and Medicare doesn't pay differently too, then we're missing at least, you know, like you could say a third or more of the payments. And then that's not a very consistent signal uh, for the providers if Medicare doesn't pay differently. So that's why we're continuing to pursue Medicare as a partner here. The work group that, uh, the work group met between August 25th and November 29th on this particular topic, how we would continue to engage with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation for Medicare future participation. And during that time, we had two subgroups that did specific work relative to global budgets, as well as total cost of care, which is what the total cost of care is a high level target. If you roll up all the services and spending in, in a state, how much does it cost and how much should it grow over time? What, what is the seven and five? There were seven meetings. Oh, and five. Okay. Meetings. I thought that was how you named the groups. Like there were oh. seven people in five weeks. Oh. <laughs> that would have been like hip and cool. Are the you seven five or are the you five shun? group? <laughs> I'm shut. <laughs> and so it, this is a, a little bit more of a timeline for what we expect um, in terms of we have a we had an agreement, we signed the extension for that agreement in November of 2022. Now we have um, an amended and restated agreement that will operate in, and then a future potential agreement would take effect in 25. Um, and we're looking at approaching this work in three phases. And we've done the first phase of work, which I discussed where we uh, talked over the course of those meetings um, with healthcare stakeholders in the state. And specifically, we were working on 
a very regular basis with this group to solicit their feedback because it was our understanding at the time that our partners in the federal government weren't going to engage with us past uh, January. So we thought we would be ending our opportunity to inform our federal partners about what a next model would look like. So we were rapidly soliciting feedback in a number of areas, uh, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go back and forth here. In these seven areas, which our federal partners said have to be components of a future model. Um, so we, and these components are going to look, I think, familiar, especially because Act 167 has a requirement for developing methodologies around global payments and global budgets. Our federal partners looking at how Medicare will participate in the future in these state models, what they're putting forward to uh, us, as well as other states that have these models today in Maryland and Pennsylvania, is that a future Medicare alternative payment model that's customized for a state will include a global budget component for hospitals. And, uh, it will also need to include a statewide total cost of care target that is uh, likely there would be a multi-payer target and there would be, or an all-payer target in that case, or, and a Medicare specific target because Medicare in these models is keenly interested in its spending, um, that there be multi-payer participation across those three groups, commercial insurance, Medicaid, and Medicare, that there be goals in a future model for minimum primary care investment, that there be an inclusion of safety net providers from the start of an agreement, and that means Federal, like potentially federally qualified health centers are safety net providers. They participate in our model today, but also critical access hospitals are considered, in, uh, can be considered as a part of the safety net. That a model would address mental health, substance use disorder, and social determinants of health or health related social needs. It is very refreshing. It doesn't it sound <laughs> good, actually? <laughs> Thank no, you. Great. No, we can't have oranges in my other committee because one of my I, members I, is I don't have any orange. other cheese I brought from home, and I apologize That's to my Thank committee. You, Jenny. And there's chocolate. <laughs> chocolate and oranges go so well together. Yeah. Since we interrupted, can I ask you a question about... First of all, I assume your slides, we have them on our website. Yes. Right Could you print me a copy of her slides, please? Yeah. Is, are there anything in the, if I may, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, as long as it doesn't deviate too far. No, no, I think long. it's, I love this list. And is, are there other things that are required or you think may be required regarding, I'm thinking of the specifics of payment and payer at the, and at sort of around around what an ACO or what an alternative to an ACO may have to do. It, I, I don't know if I'm being clear, but you, you <laughs> no, mean clear. that's clear. Yeah. Uh, well, so these are. I think there's a lot of alignment between Vermont in terms of what this legislative body has discussed, what we've discussed with stakeholders, you know, in our current model and what we're doing today with these priorities, which are our federal government, you know, these priorities are CMMI's priorities. Mm -hmm. CMMI and Medicare, you know, ha they, Medicare um, has numerous ACO programs that it offers and that there are, you know, more than, I, there's between 700 and 850 ACOs in the country um, that are participating in, the Medicare ACE, in a Medicare ACO program. So there's a large number of ACOs across the country. Mm -hmm. And I think that from Medicare's perspective, it's, it's trying to consider how a model could potentially allow their global budgets for hospitals without excluding necessarily hospitals that might be in an ACO model. If that makes sense, yeah, they're because they they're concerned that their models can't always be exclusive of each other. Mm -hmm. 
if that makes if that, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, that's not exactly what I'm getting at. And maybe you and I should have an offline conversation because I'm trying yeah. to wrap but my head around your question, something. Yeah. Uh, do we need an ACO in order to accomplish our goals? Well, ultimately, yeah, but yeah. So that. But that if we do more. have an ACO or whatever we have, that may be a different thing than an ACO. Yeah. Are there parameters for how that will work? Because right now, we have an ACO that isn't doing what we thought it was supposed to have done and trying to put tighter guidelines on that so work we're, but now we're going now we're getting yeah so you so and i can we'll talk back to that and i know we're going to have that conversation thank as you we get to acl accountable care organization thank right. you accountable care organization is a group of uh, providers that agree to work together to coordinate around the delivery of patient care uh, and to be accountable for the cost and the quality of that care. So the providers come together in a legal arrangement, which is under the you know kind of the ACE, the accountable care organization model, and then do that work together. It's. Um, Okay, they're from an HMO. It's one it pair in Vermont. One pair. Yeah. So here's what I'm going to suggest. We're moving right. off of where we want to be yeah. right now. Okay. And we're moving into a different discussion. ACO. I'll let one more question happen. And then I think we're just going to listen to you present your slides. Because okay. I'm, I'm very aware of the time. And I know that you are moving to a new position in, with Senator Welch. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know when we'll ever get you back. <laughs> and. Wendy and I have so many great workforce updates too. I know. Healthcare and we workforce want that. Updates. If we don't get to it, maybe Wendy will share it with us. If we don't get to it today. Absolutely. Yes. And you have a you have a handy chart too. Good. Okay. Senator Weeks, one question. No, no question. Good. Oh, Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So I'll go backwards now a little bit here. Um. We we talked we did we talked about paying differently than fee for service. One of the ways that you can pay differently than fee for service is through an ACO model, where the accountable care organization um, is responsible for a total cost of care for a population of payments, and the accountable care organization receives the alternative payment you know that's contracted with the payers or. Um, so, so that is, and that is the model that we're working in in today. And we've been, you know, accountable care organizations have been active in the state um, since 2012. Uh, One Care Vermont is the accountable care organization that participates in the all payer model agreement. There is another accountable care organization that is has had a budget review by the Green Mountain Care Board. And there have been a couple of other accountable care organizations at different periods of time and are not active today. But there is one other active one uh, called Lower Healthcare, and it has one Vermont provider group that participates in it. Um, so when we're, when we're thinking about what would it mean for Vermont to continue in an alternative payment model with Medicare specifically, which is part of what we are tasked, what we are tasked with doing, the work group over the summertime elevated some really key considerations that we have then in turn been trying to advocate with CMMI, which is the federal partner. Vermont has a number, Vermont has um, you know, a number of, of factors that make it really critical that we consider what Medicare does differently with, with our state. The first is we're one of the oldest states in the nation and we're also rapidly aging in Vermont. And these, this would suggest that we might see higher Medicare costs in our state. Um, in fact, we are the lowest spending Medicare state in the nation. We are also, even in spite of being an older and aging state, we also consistently rank as one of the healthiest states in the nation. And Vermont has been engaged in iterative <coughs> health care reform over many, many years. And these health care reform initiatives that are, are shown here in this chart are specific payment and delivery initiatives 
I also want to acknowledge all of the work that Vermont has done in other healthcare reform projects, like expanding coverage and um, expanding coverage, uh, wraparound services and supports uh, for individuals, uh, Medicaid program that we have through our 1115 waiver that allows Vermont to do a lot of very unique investments in services and support that otherwise wouldn't be paid for. So we have, you know, in our state a history of many iterative reform pieces that I think taken together are impacting the health and the cost of care. That does not mean that we can't and that it does not mean that care is at a place where people would view it as affordable, that people would view their experiences as being the best possible experience. We have continual work to do here. But when we think about doing that work with Medicare specifically, it's really important that we get some credit for what we have achieved and that we get Medicare to agree that it will continue to sustain some of the real innovative work that we've done in the blueprint for health, for example, which Medicare is paying for now through the uh, through the current contract that we have. Um, so we we really want to ensure that our partners understand that we're overperforming relative to other states. And it's critical that that understanding is there. I'm sorry for toggling around so much, because we are at a point with our system, which I reflected on early in the presentation, where it's, the system is not stable. And the United States is having a challenging time in healthcare across the board. There's no doubt about it. Um, but Vermont's healthcare cost containment efforts with Medicare in particular, we've bent that cost growth curve since we entered this model agreement. And we've, we've instead of growing more rapidly than national healthcare with Medicare, which we were, we're growing consistently through all of the years of this agreement, we're growing less quickly. So when we, we have achieved what we set out to do in that 2016 contract that we signed, we've achieved that with respect to Medicare. If we continue to do more with Medicare and to grow, you know, to continue to need to grow less quickly than the nation, we will be, do, we will be doing a disservice. That will, that will not make our system sustainable. It will impact the sustainability of our, of our provider system. Uh, a future Medicare payment model for Vermont, when we look towards the next model, it has to reflect the actual cost to deliver care. It has to provide financial sustainability for participants. If we, like, I, you know, we think about how these budgets are set. If you set a global budget for a hospital, for example, based on this year, where so many are ending the year in the red, there's no way that looking forward that's going to be sustainable. And we really need our partners in Medicare to understand this critically. Um, we've also, like I said, maintained growth that's lower than the national average. And we would like to get some credit for that. So money back. <laughs> Which we never do. Which we never do. Um, literal credit. Investments, <laughs> yeah. yes. Well, and the other thing, you know, I just want to say that Vermont has been a leader in all of this. Yes. Across the country. And yeah. regardless of your feelings about individual components of the system, that um, this has been a, a real, um, it's been a help to other states and to CMMI. Yes. But we do, we'll, it would be great to get some benefit. And CMMI is real, I, I think that um, I can say, you know, uh, that the, like there's a recognition, it's just, it's not from CMMI itself, but there's a recognition right. at the federal level that Medicare in particular mm -hmm. hasn't kept pace with investing in primary care. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something where there's been, you know, a lot of 
work on it. There's a new, relatively new um, 2021 report from the National Academies of Engineering, Science, and Medicine that recommends that the federal government needs to step up its investment in primary care specifically. So I think we have some shared values. You know, values. Yeah. Um, so the work group, I'm going to give a high level just kind of summary of this sub subgroup activities of this work group because the Green Mountain Care Board is going to talk a lot more in depth about the global budget development methodology, which we've been doing all of this work with them in partnership. The global budget um, subgroups that spun out of the healthcare reform work group, we co facilitated those with the Green Mountain Care Board. There's going to be a new, even deeper in the weeds, global budget for hospital technical group that's launching, and we will co lead. You know, I say we. I won't be there, but others in the Agency of Human Services will be co-leading this work with Green Mountain Care Board. And we are working as close partners with Green Mountain Care Board uh, as, as Act 167 requires, but also in close partnership because the hospital sustainability work um, is, is critical and there is a very strong relationship to the work that we do with our federal partners in terms of long-term stability for hospitals, which I just referenced. Um, if, you know, if we're working in a Medicare model that doesn't support the long-term stability of our hospitals as our state ages more rapidly and is older than others, you know, we, that, that's very problematic. Um, so we think that in the global budget aspect we would like to see as much flexibility as possible from our federal partners to set the model for hospitals so that the state the way that the state today can influence how the aco program works that the state would have influence and flexibility in a potential global budget model that would be for hospitals um, those have been key objectives and other states join us with in that perspective it's probably not surprising why wouldn't the states want more flexibility but i do think um, that we have good company with those other states that are likely to work with cmmi um, in advocating that there be that there that the global budget model for hospitals not be rigidly prescribed from the federal level like, I, I think that will be difficult. Um, there's some difficulty today already in a number of CMS models that have been put out. Uh, those models are so rigid and are a bit of a black box that I think there's been, you know, hospitals have declined to participate. So I think we need transparency and flexibility. So as we, uh, as this work continues, uh, there will be ongoing weekly meetings with CMMI. One of our um, places where we advocated with CMMI strongly was to say that uh, we weren't ready yet to stop talking with them. They wanted to stop talking, but they, they felt that for their clearance process to be effective and to be able to offer a next potential model that they would need to stop engaging with states uh, starting now. Instead, we've advocated that we need a lot more conversation with them and they will continue engaging with the state of Vermont through the summertime. So we'll continue meeting with them. The state of Vermont also has a regular monthly meeting with the director of the Innovation Center. We the state of Vermont is co-launching this more deep in the weeds technical global budget work group. We're also going to launch, and this is a, a, a place where uh, Wendy has really been lead in thinking about when part, part of why um, we seek these partnerships with Medicare specifically to do things differently is Medicare also has some really rigid rules around um, reimbursement regulatory rules who can bill medicare for example for example if you're going to go to a skilled nursing facility in original Med medicare 
you can't go to that skilled nursing facility and have Medicare pay for it unless you've been admitted first to the hospital. In the model that we're operating today, the ACO model, the uh, person's Medicare beneficiaries can go directly to a skilled nursing facility through a waiver. We want to explore how well the waivers that are in place today are working. We want to look at waivers that are in place through other ACO models because there is a new ACO model that's called the REACH ACO model and that provides waivers that allow nurse practitioners and other advanced practice professionals to bill Medicare. And we want to look at what waivers have we not considered that we think are crucial. One of the areas we've highlighted is Medicare paying for um, licensed mental health and substance use disorder clinicians, whereas right now they're more limited in paying for master's level social work versus licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselors, for example. There has been, um, Congress has taken action to expand Medicare's reimbursements of mental health and substance use disorder professionals. And what we need to do is determine what gaps still remain even after Congress has, has taken action. We think there still may be some gaps and we would be interested in seeing if we can fill those with a custom model. Um, that, so that work group will be fun. And <laughs> yes, I will. I'm with you. It sounds like very fun. <laughs> uh, and then there, then and then from from there, there's going to be a much broader engagement of um, of the public and of citizens on this topic through town hall meetings and other uh, forums to share what we've learned, to share the frameworks that are being considered or under consideration and to gather that feedback. We're really close. This was my last slide in terms of the update. Good, yeah. um, and we did have the workforce update for you as well, but I'm not sure that... Do you have that one grid? That the grid? Yeah. I mean, what, what makes sense? Um, I would like to give everyone, I need, I need a minute, that's all. I guess I'm being selfish, so why don't you go ahead and we'll see where we get with a minute. I think we could do an overview of it pretty quickly. And I might, I might ask Wendy if she can share her screen on, on the grid because I don't have it pulled up currently on my computer, if that's faster. I don't know if you do, Wendy. It's okay if you don't. Whatever you think is most efficient with the small amount of time we have. And Wendy, we can bring you back if, if, you've got, if you don't mind uh, as we look at this. Oh, we can't see that. Yeah. She's smaller because I think if you just magnify it, yeah. Go. There we go. That's good. Good. Perfect. Okay, so this will be switching gears to um, initiatives that were put forward in Act 183 of 2022 mm -hmm. to support the healthcare workforce. Like I, we've talked about the disruption from COVID-19 and the particular ways that that's impacted healthcare providers. I think you probably understand that the healthcare workforce, typically when there are huge economic disruptions, recessions, depressions, the healthcare workforce actually remains fairly stable and can even grow during these times. Healthcare has been a growth sector. It's been one of those sectors where people are encouraged to pursue, you know, opportunities because of that growth. With the pandemic, which was a public health emergency, uh, that certainly has changed the healthcare workforce in huge ways. And so Act 183 is a whole, and, and, and the overall workforce. Act 183 legislation sought to um, provide for investments to improve Vermont's workforce across the board, and then in particular with some ways relative to the healthcare workforce. The first um, activity was for there to be emergency grants that would support nurse, faculty, and staff. So these are educators who would be training and educating 
future workforce, future nurse workforce, and the deliverable here, this is a $2 million investment with in emergency interim grants to Vermont's nursing schools over three years to be the deliverable. Um, this was something where the De Vermont Department of Health was responsible for this activity. And this activity and all of these investments were funded through state fiscal recovery funds, federal funds for coronavirus relief. Um, but not coronavirus relief funds, state fiscal recovery funds. Um, and these, uh, so this, this is something where working within the SFR requirements, um, VDH has sought to determine whether um, the nursing schools uh, can meet the expectations for the state fiscal recovery funds. And once that assessment is complete, they're going to take the next steps to try to to try to issue these funds. You may have heard that the state fiscal recovery funds, and certainly I invite Wendy, who's worked with these much more extensively than me, um, speaking of rig rigidity and requirements, there are some very narrow ways that you can meet the requirements in order to use these funds appropriately and in compliance with the federal rules and guidelines. So here's what I'm going to suggest. I think this, this, there's enough here and enough activity going on outside in our various institutions and communities that it would be great if we could um, have Wendy come in and yeah. do a deep dive, unless you want to return to do that. Uh, Wendy, Wendy is the expert. Sounds like Wendy, Wendy is the expert. And Wendy, would, can we have you schedule in with Alex and have you come in on this? Because this is a big deal. And we'll also be looking later on in the session about how, what do we need to continue, uh, what more needs appropriation, and so on. So having your expertise and bringing in the information would be terrific. Yeah, so we like this partnered with an understanding of where the premium paid program is coming, uh, is going. I realize that this one is focused on Act 183, or I'm happy to talk with Alex about the best steps in our next testimony. Terrific. Thank you so much. And Ina, thank you. Um, we are going to miss you, but we'll see you in another capacity, most likely. Uh, Ina is moving on to become, what, what, what is your, going to be your title? Um, the title is Outreach Representative, which means I'll manage the Health and Human Services portfolio for the Vermont Office of Senator Welch. Just a minor job. <laughs> Huh. Huge. Thank you. Yeah, your work has been uh, exceptional. We're going to miss you a great deal. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for today. This is good. This is a good start, good introduction. We'll be coming back to every single bit of it in one way or another. So it's good. Thank you. Thank well, you. We're good. We can go on one. All right. <laughs>